via its representations. So for example, we can look at maps from the Galois group to, say, the orthomorphisms of an n-dimensional vector space. But even just for now, let's consider the orthomorphisms of a one-dimensional vector space, which is the complex numbers, and its orthomorphism group is just the units. So this is a group. This is a, also a group. Usually, if you consider representations, you like to take a little bit of care about the topology of both sides. So this C has a usual topology. This group here has a very different topology, named it's a profinite topology coming from an inverse limit. So if you insist this is continuous, it's forced to factor through some finite extension. And so in other words, a map from this group is just the map of the Galois group of a finite extension, or even the map of a finite abelian extension, to C star. And if it was n-dimensional branch representations, it would still force the factor through a finite image. OK. All right, so there are two ways to try to understand such representations. And I want to sort of give you an analog of, of these two ways of trying to understand a representation. So a sort of a geometric analog. So if you have some kind of geometric object, say a manifold with singularities or some kind of cover, one way to try to study it is to try and study its global nature by kind of thinking about the entire object. But another way of uh, trying to study it is sort of ignoring the parts where it's smooth and just studying the singularities and knowing enough about the singularities and hoping that will tell you something about the global structure. So there's an analog in number theory uh, corresponding to these two ways of thinking about the representations. So one, which is kind of a global way, is as follows. So it turns out that in such a representation, that for all but finitely many primes are L, there exists a special element, or even a special conjugacy class, for Benius at L inside the Galois group of any finite extension. And then, let's say this is a group G, finite group G. And then if you look at the representation, say, of G to C star, or even to, well, let me just stick even with one dimensional representations, G to C star then this G, together with the image of this conjugacy class for all, or all but these finitely many, L, determines the representation rho. So here, global, in this context of thinking about the whole thing, is thinking about global in the sense of you have the number field, Q, and you're thinking about all, all the primes. So this is a consequence of the Chebotarov density theorem. And just to give a very concrete example, if k was equal to the field qi, and you're just looking at the map from the Galois group of this extension, which is quadratic extension to z mod 2 to c star, then there's a nice Frobenius element inside this group for all odd primes. And what you find is that if L is congruent to 1 mod 4, that Benius at L maps to 1, and if L is congruent to 3 mod 4, Frobenius of L is equal to minus 1. So these Frobenius elements are reflecting something about the behavior of L in this number field. In particular, in this case, if L is a prime that's 1 mod 4, it splits. If L is 3 mod 4, it's quadratic. But these conditions, just ignoring this field, well, if we knew it was degree 2, we would know it's a quadratic field. But knowing this distribution and this exact sort of structural nature of what happens to Rubinius determines not only, of course, it's the quadratic field, but determines exactly which field it is. Okay. So that's often a useful way of thinking about Galois representations, is thinking about them together with the collection of the images 
of these conjugacy classes of Frobenius. So, of course, if you look at an n-dimensional representation and you have a conjugacy class, then you look at the data corresponding to its characteristic polynomial. OK, but actually, for the, today's talk, what's probably more relevant is a second way of looking at the representation. And this is more, uh, well, perhaps I won't call it local, but it's looking at ramification. And again, it's the geometric idea that if you, understand, if you have some nice manifold, but, well, manifold but has some sort of singularities, that maybe the nature of those singularities are kind of uh, enough to really try and pin down uh, the global object. So what's going on here? Here is now you understand, say, this extension or this representation uh, in terms of the bad primes. So let's continue talking about this case where k is just qi. The Galois group is z mod 2z, and with this natural map to the complex numbers. So if you think about this quadratic field, its discriminant is equal to minus 4. And so here, the bad primes, well, 2 is going to be a bad prime. But since prime in this context doesn't just mean all the finite primes, but also uh, some completion, we also include the prime or the place infinity. Okay. So let me kind of look at the structure of this extension and this representation at these two bad primes. So first, let's do the case of infinity. So what does it mean to look locally? In the case of infinity, well, here, instead, we have an extension qi, which is sitting over, over q. To look at an infinity is to look at the situation when we take the, cor the corresponding completion. Namely, here we get r, and here we get the complex numbers. Okay, so the behavior at infinity is this information that instead of just being r over r, it's the complex numbers. And so here we have some information about restricting this representation. You naturally can restrict this map from the Galois group of q on q to c star. You can restrict it to the Galois group of the complex numbers over the real numbers. I should, if I say restrict, I shouldn't do the arrow this way. So I have a map here, and I'm just taking a restriction. You may have to make some choices to consider this as a subgroup, but from this representation, we now get a map from here to here, which in this case is just uh, the non-trivial map. But we'd also like to do this at the prime too. And when you do this construction at a finite prime, well, you get richer information. So namely, here we have this field over Q. And in, instead of completing at the infinite prime and getting the real numbers, you can complete at the prime two and get the toadic numbers. And then correspondingly, you get a ramified extension of the toadic numbers. And now you can restrict your representation of gal Q bar over Q. Again, in this case, maybe just mapping to plus or minus bar one, you can restrict it to the representation of the Galois group of this toadic field and get something here. Again, you'll have image of order two, but unlike in the case of the real numbers, I mean, this is not a group which carries a huge amount of information. It's a group of order two. On the other hand, the Galois group of the toadic numbers, even though somehow it's a lot simpler than the Galois group of, of all the algebraic numbers, it's still rich enough to give some interesting information about this extension. And so the global way is to think about these primes for Benius at all the kind of good primes, but you have to think about infinitely many of them. The ramification picture is just to concern yourself with what happens at the primes of bad ramification. And so we don't quite get as good as, as this conclusion from Chebotarev that this global information tells you anything. But you have the following. Say, if I have a representation of this Galois group, say, to GLN of C, and let's say it's ramified at uh, only at primes dividing, say, S, then the collection of these representations restricted to the Galois groups 
of the completions at the bad primes of s, well, again, it doesn't quite determine the representation, but it determines, in, determines it up to some finite ambiguity. So this determines rho up to finite ambiguity. Okay. All right. So that's just a sort of introduction in terms of the context of looking at representations of the Galois group to GLN of C. But in fact, it turns out that these representations, um, it's not necessarily the only field that we want to look at representations over. It turns out that geometry provides a source of Galois representations, not to kind of an n-dimensional space over the complex numbers, but to an n-dimensional space over the piatic numbers. So I want to talk about that next. So let me talk about piatic representations. OK. So let's suppose that x is equal to gm. Or if you want to think about it differently, just think about the complex numbers, but I want to think about this as a group, as a natural group structure. And now look at the p to the n torsion points of x. So in other words, look at the points uh, whose p to the nth power is trivial. What is that? That's exactly the p to the nth roots of unity. So this is uh, just the p to the nth roots of unity. Well, what is this? As an abelian group, it's just a cyclic group of order p to the n. But it also has an action of the Galois group. I mean, these are literally roots of unity, and they cut out a field given by the p to the nth roots of unity. And there's an action of this Galois group on here, which is just factoring through the Galois group of q z to p to the n over q which then acts on this. So if you start taking this for larger and larger n, well, you get more and more roots of unity. But the action of the Galois group is compatible. And it acts on the p to the n torsion points inside the p to the n torsion points in the way it did uh, previously. And so you can take a direct limit, or you can take an inverse limit, depending on how you want to do. And then you can get an action, that's probably better, of GQ on the inverse limit of, well, let me write it, of z mod p to the nz, which is equal to the periodic numbers. And it's acting uh, via an infinite quotient. All right, the action of this mod p, this is just the inverse limit of these guys. If you reduce this mod p to the n, you have this, and it's acting through this Galois group, which is finite. But as n gets bigger and bigger, well, it ends up in this limit as acting through an infinite quotient, which is just the Galois group of q with all the p to the nth roots of unity for all n. And it acts in this way. Now, you might if you ever taught algebra. This Galois group is abelian, and it's equal to z mod p to the nz star. This group acts on here in the most natural way, a root of unity What's the an element in here? It's just it sends a root of unity to its eighth power for some a prime to p to the n. And that's the element a in here. And it acts on this, because this is exactly the roots of unity, by multiplication by a. OK. So if I were to describe this, actually, in the global point of view, I would do a computation and actually show you that if I take this map that I've constructed to, well, it's acting on this, which are the automorphisms of this. So I have a map here that's just the units. And that lives inside the units of some field, namely the periodic numbers, which is GL1 of QP. So in this way, I've now constructed a representation, a one-dimensional representation here. But now it has infinite image. And moreover, 
For complex representations, the image always has to be finite because the topology on the complex numbers is really very different from here. But in this situation, the topology of QP or of ZP is much more of a pro-finite nature and so interacts with the Galois group in a suitable way. And so I get a representation that's continuous uh, of infinite image. Okay. And let me now kind of describe it in the two separate ways. The first way would be describe it by looking at the primes of good reduction, which is all primes away from P, and say what happens to Frobenius. So if I call this, a calculation says that rho of Frobenius at L is actually equal to L. Okay. And in fact, this is enough to determine the representation globally. But the second way of looking at it would just be uh, restrict this representation just to the Galois group of Q bar P over QP. So what happens here? Well, it still factors through the Galois group of QP of Z to P to the N over QP, which turns out to be the same thing. In other words, when you go up this tower and you take the P to the N roots of unity, not only is it ramified at P, the ramification structure that's going on there is really telling you, in fact, everything about the representation. Okay. All right. So, well, this construction here is an example of an infinite dimensional, uh, as, as a representation in which the Gauss group acts in an infinite way. But in fact, it's just an example of, uh, of very many things of the general type. Uh, so, more generally, uh, say if x on q is, uh, say, uh, smooth compact variety, well, then you can look at its cohomology groups with coefficients in QP, these cohomology groups are just exactly the same as the usual cohomology groups of this manifold. But now, uh, what it turns out is the fact that x comes from a variety over Q means that you can somehow remember that structure, and then in the end, this acquires an action of the Galois group of Q. And so you get, in this way, a representation of the Galois group of Q so if this is n-dimensional, an n-dimensional representation here over QP. And as long as you look in cohomology of degree bigger than 0, then it has a very similar flavor to this example here. For example, if you just take the first cohomology of GM, you get and recover exactly the representation that we constructed here, maybe up to the type of examples of, of Gauss representations with periodic Gauss representations with big image. Now, it turns out that. Um, you can also just construct completely random representations that have nothing at all to do with geometry. The ones that kind of come in this geometric way are somehow very special. I mean, here's a kind of stupid remark. The ones that come from varieties over Q, there's only going to be countably many of them. But in fact, you can write many uncountable representations uh, that don't come from geometry. So one kind of goal that one has as follows is uh, among all Galois represent Gala representations of a QP, understand which ones come from geometry. That's sort of, let's say, goal A. Goal B is link the geometric Galois representations, say, to uh, L functions and automorphic forms. So in other words, uh, if you start with some variety, you can come, cook up in a natural way a various class of L functions defined by how many points x has of a various finite extensions. And you can just construct some 
function that certainly is well behaved, say some L k x s, that's well defined for some parameter uh, in the complex plane whose real part of s is sufficiently large. And there are a whole suite of conjectures that conjecture that this satisfies some functional equation, satisfies some meromorphic or even analytic continuation, depending on, on x. And these are sort of very mysterious from the point of view of starting with x, but there's a whole suite of conjectures in the Langlands program that link it to automorphic forms, and then they're sort of conjecturally linked to Gower representations. Okay. So let me now draw a cartoon picture. Uh, yes. <laughs> I mean, I, I, and, and you'll see why, and I, let me, I'll try to context. I think maybe my, my talk will, will answer your question. When I thought, who is the target audience for my talk? I thought, Tom Church. So if you, if you don't like this talk, then I, I failed miserably. <laughs> okay. So here's the cartoon picture. Here are all Galois representations. And so let's be a little bit more precise. Let's maybe think from GQ to GLN of QP. So I'll fix some parameters. All right. So I, I said somehow um, we should understand Galois representations by restricting to the primes of bad ramification. So I'm going to cheat a little bit. Little bit. If you have a finite Gower representation that factors through some finitely extension, and it's only around finitely many primes. If you have an infinite Gower representation, it could plausibly be around infinitely many primes. You have to try really, really hard to construct an example that has that property. But everything that comes from real life, from some variety x, it will have good reduction outside finitely many primes, so you'll be in good shape. So I'm just going to always assume that they're only around finitely many primes. So the moral of my story earlier, which is think about what's happening at the primes of bad reduction suggest look at the restriction of this to say what's happening at p, but also at a few other primes of ramification too. But it turns out that when you look at l adic representations into GLQP, they're somehow very restrictive, just to, in the same way that representations of the of c over r to c star are very restrictive. So it's actually, if you're ambitious, good enough just to restrict these representations to what I'll call the local representations. And these will be representations of GQP, which is the Galois group, I should write it down, of QP bar over QP to GLN QP. So this map here is just restriction. Okay. All right, so inside here, you want to identify what things are actually arising from some kind of geometric construction. And this is, at least to begin with, a kind of complicated picture, but there are certainly at least necessary conditions that came out of Piatic Hodge theory. And the main conjecture of Fontaine Mesa is that these local conditions are enough to guarantee that it should come from geometry. So let's put inside here what I'll call the, so let, let me give this a name. I'll call this x global. I'll call this x local. And I'll call this x uh, um, well, local and geometric. I mean, to say geometric, that's a bit of a kind of putting the cart before the horse, but motivic is the, is the word that's used for actually coming from geometry. So this is, this is living inside here. This is the locus of points that have any hope of, at all of being geometric. And the conjecture of Fontaine Mesa says that if you have something inside here, that actually has this nice shape at p, then it should really come from geometry. OK. So this is a cartoon picture. Here I've just drawn some bubbles and attached some names to it. So let me now be a bit, try to be a bit more precise and turn this picture into actually something that makes sense. OK. So it would be nice, actually, instead of thinking about a bubble of Olgar representations, to actually think about a space. <laughs> 
So if you take a group and you say, well, what's the space of all representations? Well, you're in good shape if you have a finitely presented group because you can just write down the corresponding representation variety. You can just say, send all my generators to matrices, and then the relations just give me a bunch of equations, and I can write down some variety that parameterizes it. So the question is, well, can you do this in this context here? And the answer is not quite, and not quite, in some sense, mostly for sort of a silly technical reason. And then, of course, here you have a profinite group. And so profinite groups, they may be, even if it was finitely generated, the relations that you get are kind of going to be complicated and not necessarily polynomial relations. But essentially, things are still OK. I mean, let me make one remark. So if you take a representation from GQ to GLNQP, it actually turns out that after conjugation, it lives inside GLNZP. The compactness argument shows that it's sort of really living inside here. Once you have that, you can reduce mod p, and you get a representation inside GLNFP. And let me call this representation Roba. So you start with your representation, you choose a lattice, you get some reduction that's now this map. And again, it has to have a finite image. Just, well, I guess the right is finite, so that's certainly true. OK, so rho bar is not entirely determined by rho, but at least rho bar semi-simplification is determined by, by rho. So what you see is if you're going to have some legitimate family of Gower representations, for each of these families, they should, if you have a fa be locally constant, but this data of a rho bar is a kind of fairly discrete invariant. So actually, to make sense of this, you really need to fix one of these rho bars. But once you do that, you're in good shape. So if you fix this row bar, for example, if it was irreducible, it would be the same as the semi simplification. You have genuine spaces, x global mapping to x local, mapping to x local geometric. And this is mapping inside here. So I say spaces. What kind of spaces are they? Are there? Are they? Uh, it wouldn't hurt to think about them as something like this. I mean, we have to sort of be a bit careful in terms of what spaces are. We somehow are fixing a mod p reduction. Here's a typical thing that you might have. A power series over zp in k variables. Well, I, you said I wanted a space. This doesn't look like a space. So what do I mean by this? This is, I mean, just write spec. If you don't like spec, essentially, I want to choose k p-adic numbers such that the power series converges. So I just think of k p-adic numbers, all of which have valuation less than or equal to 1. So that's just kind of like a ball. And that's typically, in fact, what these look like. They look like some kind of ball, maybe with sort of more complicated singularities, but, but there's kind of a nice geometric picture here. Yeah, you should imagine we have a, we're trying to write down a group variety. So we take generators. But because it's profinite, we maybe want to do things infinitesimally as opposed to kind of. So I mean, if we had a group and you take its profinite completion and you did this construction, you would get, in fact, just a completion of your character variety at, at, at some point. But it's some object like this. OK. So let me draw some pictures that are actually really pictures. That's a ball here. This is a ball here. What does this look like? Well, when you say something is geometric, there's actually a whole bunch of other data you can put in. You could say this looks like it comes from H2 of a variety, or maybe it looks like it comes from H7 of a variety, or maybe it looks like it comes from H14 of a variety twisted by something else, which has some kind of reduction at P. So there's actually an infinite collection of, of extra data one could put on here so let me kind of put here a parameter n, where n can get bigger and bigger. And so essentially, if you n, you get, again, some nice, nice space inside here. But as n gets bigger and bigger, it starts filling out more and more of this space. But in any sort of particular circumstance, we may as well just fix n. Right? For example, we could look at two-dimensional Gower representations of q. 
we could look at things that look like they come from elliptic curves. And then we can try and say, when do we know a two-dimensional Gaia representation sort of may actually come from an elliptic curve or may come from something global. We, we don't want to put in some conditions that just comes from some geometry at all. We want to be more precise about what happens. Okay. All right. So what else do we know about this map? Well, at least sometimes, at least morally always, this is going to be finite. So that's kind of recovering what I said at the beginning, which is understanding the ramification behavior at, at this kind of key prime. It doesn't maybe tell you the whole global geometry of the representation, but maybe it tells you up to kind of some finite, uh, finite ambiguity. Yeah, so I fix some finite set primes S of, of bad reduction. Yeah. And I, I might fix some set of Hodge Tate weights and some finite extension over which it becomes crystalline or, or semi stable. All right. So here is reality check one. So somehow what we're claiming. So mapping, well, here, this is this picture here. We're claiming, or at least Font and Mazur claim, they're pretty smart people, that if you take a point that is here that's also in the image of this, that it should come from something actually in, in global geometry. So the first reality check is to try to do some computation where you compute, for example, uh, what the co-dimension of each of these spaces are. I mean, if the co-dimension, if the sort of expected dimension of the intersection was positive, that would sort of be fairly poor evidence for the conjecture. So again, let me go to the case of uh, n equals two dimensional representations uh, of GQ. And in this case, well, I mean, for a nice choice of rho bar and a nice even choice, well, let me say nice choice of rho bar, what you actually have is that x local is a five-dimensional ball. X global is a three-dimensional ball. And X local geometric, well, for any kind of fixed set of parameters, this will have dimension equal to two. It may have more and more components as n gets bigger. But certainly in each particular case, when you take this intersection of something of dimension three and dimension two inside a five-dimensional space, the numbers are working out. So here, 2 plus 3 <coughs> equals 5. So that's a nice check that this conjecture is plausible. OK. All right, well, of course, to say that a conjecture is plausible, it's not the same as saying that it's true. So um, yeah. So the question is, how does one start to kind of say anything about why it might be true. Well, of course, it's hard to directly relate this picture that's just really a, a group and its deformations to anything that has something to do with geometry. So of course, what's ha what happens is that for any conjecture, it's usually much easier to prove the conjecture if you make the conjecture harder. So in other words, it's hard to say that a two-dimensional representation of some flavor comes from some geometry if you don't tell you itself anything about what geometric thing it comes from. But if you say, well, I actually expect this two-dimensional representation not just to come from geometry, but maybe actually come from an elliptic curve, or maybe actually come from a modular form, or from the cohomology of a Schmoor variety, that places you into a position where you know exactly what objects you want to try and match up. And then you want to try to count that at least th th the same number, for example, of Gower representations as there are of the appropriate geometric things that you may hope to relate it to. So this is exactly the game. And again, for two-dimensional representations, I'll just say odd, but ignore that, of GQ, the way that you start to even understand this as all is by introducing a compute completely different picture, which is namely understanding a very special class of uh, of Gower representations coming from geometry, namely you understand 
uh, Galois representations coming from modular forms. Okay. So um, this is a whole story uh, in and of itself. But uh, let me just say a little bit about that. So let me. So what is a modular form? So let me instead talk a, a, about automorphic forms. And let me just give you, a, again, a very compressed description of, of automorphic forms. Well, automorphic forms, there has to be some other fixed data. And here we're looking at two-dimensional representations. So we have to think about the group GL2, or in particular, think about uh, what turns out to be similar, various congruent subgroups of SL2z and various modular curves H quotient by gamma. And these are nice. I mean, they're, they're sort of cusped uh, uh, to, well, complex, well, they're one-dimensional complex manifolds. Again, I, I, yes. I don't know if you want me to call them curves with points missing or, or nice surfaces with a complex structure with cusps. I don't know what, what, whatever your flavor of, of topology might be. OK. All right, so what is an automorphic form? Well, an automorphic form, one way of thinking about it is not necessarily a function on this, but maybe some kind of type of differential on this space. You can then, of course, lift it to h. This is just the upper half plane. It's simply connected. So you can also think about it as some function on h that satisfies some cast of transformation properties under gamma. Maybe if it's a differential, maybe it's sort of some vector. There's a whole bunch of, of various things on h that are invariant under something to do with respect to various subgroups. And that at least is roughly the world of, of, of automorphic forms, at least the ones we're interested in. So how can they be related to x? Well, if you imagine the x is actually compact, which it's not, then there's a way of understanding module of automorphic forms. I mean, if they correspond to differentials, how do you understand differ differentials on a space? Well, what type of differentials are they? Maybe that the automorphic forms are sufficiently nice, they correspond to harmonic differentials. And if they're harmonic differentials, you just need to study the Durham cohomology of x. And this will have the intimation that's necessary. And in fact, for the automorphic forms that should come from Gower representations, they exactly correspond, uh, at least with some particular choice of weight, to harmonic forms that then contribute to this cohomology. And so what happens is there's a completely different world where you replace this, but you start to study the cohomology of these kind of objects. Well, these are basically very simple in terms of their cohomology. And in fact, you can translate from this to start studying just the usual singular cohomology. And then you can have somehow extra control by looking at the cohomology with coefficients in z. Okay. So it turns out that you could even be more precise about the degree of cohomology that it corresponds to. In this case here, it's very clear that for all the things we're interested in, they're going to contribute just to h1. I mean, here we're looking just essentially at a at a punctured surface, doesn't have h2, h0 is one dimensional. All, all the interesting business is going on in h1. Okay. Now, of course, here, this seems like a long way away removed from the world of Gower representations. So the first thing to do at all, if you want to start connecting this world, is to do the following. You have to take this, and you have to do, you have to find Gower representations uh, associated to cohomology, that's sort of step one. Um, uh, and step two, I mean, you want not just Gower representations. I mean, you, you don't just want to construct things here. You want to construct things here that are hopefully geometric and hopefully sort of live inside this world too. So you also want to show these Gower representations uh, are nicely behaved uh, at P. Uh, 
In fact, you can find p-adic rep representations for any choice of auxiliary p, and then you show that they have these good behavior at p. And so this, I mean, this business, of course, was done by many people, some of them here, um, and was a sort of big effort to kind of sort out exactly the Gower representations you got associated to module forms, that they had the right behavior, not just at primes away from p. I mean, they're certainly interesting to look at in the first point of view, where you, see, you say what's happening to Frobenius at L, but it's also interesting to say what's happening at their behavior at p. OK. All right, so I promised to talk about one-dimensional representations. So I kind of want to make this picture concrete in the case of one-dimensional representations. And it'll make it a little bit more interesting if instead of working over Q, I work over a field F. So I'll take a field F over Q. I'll let's say that P is totally split uh, in F. So that means above the prime P, so I'll assume this is equal to D, that P splits up into D different primes. So if I take a prime dividing P and I localize F at V, this is just the piadic numbers. Well, probably the piadic numbers. OK. So let me kind of describe X local, which I want to think of as a product of a X local for, for V dividing P, because I want to restrict to all the primes above P. So I want to think, what are the, what are the one-dimensional representations uh, of just the field QP. So again, I have to make some auxiliary choice of kind of mod P representation, so I'll, I'll implicitly choose it to be trivial. So basically, there are two types of representation. One, there's a cyclotomic representation that we had before. And another one, there's an unramified representation. There's always an unramified representation, which you just send for Benius to anything you want. And so what this picture really is, is each one of these is just a two-dimensional ball. If you like, so this in total is just 2D dimensional ball. So that's kind of the dimension in this case. You said, I mean, you said there's two representations of this. Yeah, but you can take any power of it, of one, and then any power of the other. Yeah. Uh, what is x sort of local that's good, uh, that's sort of a geometric, well, there's a bunch of conditions I can put in. But let's take the nicest possible condition. Let's say it's unramified. If it's unramified, then inside each ball, there's just a line. And so this is just a product of one-dimensional balls. And so th this is just a d-dimensional ball. So this is just un unramified at each prime. What happens globally? So in fact, even in this case, it's not even so clear one can compute the dimension. You think, well, didn't they, ex didn't they work out class field theory 100 years ago? And they did, but still, we don't know what the dimension of this is. If I let f have signature rs, where r plus 2s is equal to d, then the expected dimension of this, this should be something of dimension r, uh, dimension s plus 1. And in fact, it's always dimension at least this big. But to say it's of dimension exactly this is equivalent to the Leopold conjecture. So this is already some indication, even that one dimensional representation, things are complicated. But let's just put ourselves in this picture here. All right, so let's try and intersect these. So what are we actually trying to find? We're trying to find representations of GF that are unramified everywhere. That's kind of the intersection of, uh, of representations of GF that are unram well, one dimensional that are unramified away from P, and you intersect it with things that are unramified at P. So what's the expected dimension of the intersection? Well, the co-dimension here is D. The co-dimension here is D plus R plus S minus 1. So the expected dimension of the intersection is minus R plus S minus 1. Well, and that's always negative unless you take Q or an imaginary quadratic field. So what would we say from that? Well, we would say, well, therefore, there probably shouldn't exist any representations of GF that are unramified everywhere. 
But in fact, that's completely wrong. There's always a representation of GF that's unrathified everywhere, namely the trivial representation. It's not a very interesting representation, but it still has the property that's everywhere unramified. And that actually should make you worry, because we sort of at least started our heuristic view of fontaine Mesa by doing a computation and saying, well, as long as the intersection is transverse, we, we expect to have finitely many points. Here, the intersection is not transverse. Okay. So, I mean, it, it is, I should still say, it, it, we can still prove that the intersection consists of finitely many points because they correspond to now quotients of the class group, and the class group is finite, and representations of the class group, if you have a finite group, they only have finitely many representations. So you still get finitely many points. fontaine mesa conjecture is true. Uh, but this computation is in a little bit worrying. Okay. So what's going on? Oop. I can do that at least twice more <laughs> before we're in trouble. So let's go back to the, the, the previous case of classical modular forms, where we're trying to have this intersection and relate it to relate it to two-dimensional odd Gower representations of Q and somehow relate it to modular forms by doing accounting in some in some particular way. So I mean it's really we can not just think of sort of we can think more algebraically and actually take these global representations and somehow take the intersection along this space with the local representations that are nice and hope that this, is, this intersection is really, well, let me call it, say, spec R, but geometrically is something that's sort of seen by modular forms. OK, so what happens in general? Well, now the problem is we're intersecting these two objects, and they're not intersecting in a transverse way. I mean, if we expect that there is some intersection in characteristic zero that we're trying to prove actually comes from a geometry, we know that, they, that they, if these numbers are big, uh, that they intersect in somehow a highly uh, non-transitive way. Let, let me just sort of remark that if you take n-dimensional representations of GQ, then this expected dimension is equal well, to 0 if n is 0 is 1 or 2. It's 1 if n is 2 or minus 1 is minus 2 if n is equal to 4, sorry, 3, 4, 5, 6, etc. So for two-dimensional representation, things are nice. But for three dimensions or four-dimensional representations, already, from this perspective, you don't even expect to find anything in characteristic 0 at all. OK, so what's one thing that you might be led to do? Well, how do you understand in geometry when you have some intersection of, of, of things that, that don't intersect transverse, transversely? Well, geometrically, the most natural thing to do is to try and start moving them around so that they do intersect in some transverse way. OK, but in fact, there's a problem of doing that in this context is because we're really working infinitesimally. Th these are local rings. There's not much space to move around. So instead, we should be able to consider the derived intersection. So what's the derived intersection? Well, let me just say it very loosely in the context of, say, uh, I want to intersect something with equations cut out by i and intersect it with equations cut out by j. So the intersection would just be the spec of r on the equations cut out by i and j. I mean, that's what the intersection means. But in fact, somehow if you take i equal to i, which is sort of not intersecting transversely, you might want to know some, something that reflects what happens if you deviate things slightly. And so what type of thing might you try to put in? Well. Uh, Sarah already considered the following generalization, which is considered the tor of what of I don't want to put i lower of r i by r j. So if i equals zero, this tor group is just literally the same thing here. But there's some extra information that goes on for higher orders. <laughs> 
And using this, Sale was able to compute a sort of a way of a, having a reasonable intersection formula by computing not just this number, which maybe is not the right thing, but also some alternating sum of these high <coughs> objects. So they're a collection of higher order terms that reflect something about the fact that this is not a transverse intersection. So what would happen in this case, you would expect how many terms should you get? You would expect that you would have the intersection corresponding to some degree zero, but then going on, say to, in this case here, to what the co-dimension was. So uh, let me just put L0 here, referring to some kind of co-dimension of, of how non-transverse they are. So the L0 there would be like 0, minus 1, minus 2. And exactly, yeah. So you get a whole bunch of degrees here. So what happens in the classical picture of modular forms? You only have something in degree 0 if you have a nice transverse intersection. And then that intersection is reflected by a space of modular forms acting on cohomology on some H1 of an arithmetic variety. So what happens if I take an n-dimensional representation? I have some intersection, and there is some number here, which is L0. Then what does that correspond to on the automorphic side? So let me just write this here. So n equals 2 is related to the cohomology in a single degree of gamma, say, z, where gamma is inside SL2z. For n equals z, n equals n, now it seems to be related to the cohomology, but now not just, let me write this. So for now, some gamma inside SLnz, and now for i in some range, 0, 1, 2, up to L0, which was exactly this number. Some Q0 is determined by the situation, which was 1 in this case, and is whatever it is in this situation here. So in the case of classical module forms, you have some intersection, which was supposed to be the same as something coming from a space of module forms. Here, at least under some very kind of conjectural framework, what you're seeing in cohomology is not just the actual intersection, but also all the higher order intersections as well. And so what that could mean is that, in fact, sometimes it could happen that for a particular choice of level and weight, that there aren't any Gower representations. And so then what would happen there? Well, then this intersection shouldn't have any characteristic zero points. But it could still be the case when you have cohomology in more than one degree, it no longer ha has to sort of be torsion free. So this can have torsion information. And this sort of now has some data that's recording something as long as you're, you choose some way of picking out the parts that come from your specific choice of residual representation there. OK. All right. So what would you now do if you wanted to try to mimic Wiles's proof of modularity? Well, at least now we kind of have some context in which to kind of attach a wagon to and to try to start the process of repeating uh, repeating this. So basically, there are going to be three, well, there are going to be two, well, at least two ingredients. So what's ingredient one going to be? Well, the first thing is that when you look at these cohomology groups, now inside this, when you're inside SL2, you had the advantage that the corresponding quotient you got, well, it was not only was it a complex surface, uh, well, uh, a surface that had complex structure and was therefore algebraic, it also it was even algebraic and had a nice behavior over number fields. Here, these are just Riemannian manifolds, the corresponding quotients by the uh, corresponding symmetric space. And so there's no real connection of, of these spaces to arithmetic geometry when n is bigger than 2. But step one is to find Galois representations uh, associated to these classes. So this is what Peter Schultze has done in his previous paper. But that's not enough to have the Gower representations. You have to really show that they have the right behavior at all these local primes in order to kind of say that they correspond to the, the type of intersection that you might expect. So point two, you want some form of local uh, global compatibility. And in part, one thing we've been doing this week is to try to exactly understand that using the work of Cariani and Schultz. Uh, 
So in other words, the two ingredients that were needed here for whales in order to prove their result are only results coming on very recently from this work of, of Schultzer and even more recent and not yet completely written work of Cariani and Schultzer is to sort of see this. So we're sort of, in some sense, just making sure we fully understand this and understanding the implications and the way to kind of adapt this to arguments that are used in Wiles's proof. Now, of course, there are many other ingredients that one has in Wiles's proof that you don't have in general. For example, Wiles used uh, various facts related to three, five switches relating to uh, automorphic forms constructed by Langlands and, and Tunnel corresponding to weight one module forms. And these are somehow absent from our picture. But yet what we have is at least the following. So I'm not going to say any theorems, but we have sort of uh, these methods uh, seem adaptable uh, to proving the following types of theorems. So I'll just take them as conjectures. So conjecture one, well, let's just suppose that you're trying to follow Wiles as closely as possible. So suppose that E uh, is an elliptic curve, but say over an imaginary quadratic field. So Wiles works over Q, this work of uh, others who generalize this to totally real fields. But let's suppose we're working over a magic quadratic field. OK. Uh, well, then one might conjecture that if you take the corresponding L function, which is built out of how many points L has over finite fields, that this has a meromorphic continuation to the complex plane. OK, well, in fact, you'd actually conjecture it has a holomorphic continuation. And that would follow if you knew that it was automorphic. But sometimes you can get away with proving a weaker statement, namely this potentially automorphic, in which you can deduce, for example, this type of structure. Of course, conjecturally, you would put automorphic here. But I'm talking about what we think our methods may be able to approach. And this is the type of thing that, that's more reasonable. Conjecture two, uh, for such an E, it satisfies the Sato-Tate conjecture. So I'll just say that um, it's probably not interesting unless you know about the Sato-Tate conjecture. But I want to get to conjecture three since I'm pretty much out of time. This is the third conjecture, which is let pi be a regular algebraic automorphic representation for GL2 over a CM field F, which you can imagine is imaginary quadratic, uh, of weight 0. So that means it comes from the cohomology uh, of gamma R, where here gamma is now a congruent subgroup of SL2 of OF. Okay. So then it turns out that for all the finitely many primes V, there's an associated uh, parameter AV, Sataki parameter. And then the conjecture is that this is less than the square root of the norm of V. So let me just explain why this is actually interesting if you don't know anything about this. So in the case of, say, classical modular forms, if you take a classical modular form, you can actually associate it to an interesting algebraic variety. And then this statement here would be the Vey conjectures for that algebraic variety. So already for a classical modular form, it's a non-trivial statement. So here, well, conjecturally, this should also be associated to some algebraic variety. We have no idea at all how to prove that. If we knew it, then we would deduce by the Vey conjectures this statement. But the hope is we can still deduce this conjecture. And the idea, well, at least how might you deduce this? You would deduce this from potential automorphy of the k-symmetric powers 
of pi and then use the idea of Langlands, of Deline Langlands, to kind of reduce from higher weight this conclusion is low weight. So unfortunately, I'm sorry I can't state any theorems, but this is somehow roughly using this idea of, of that these very recent ideas in this field, this is the kind of result that we hope our methods may, may be able to hopefully uh, answer. Okay, sorry for going over time.